So Sheila Nasta, MBE, is Professor of Contemporary and Modern Literatures at uh, Queen Mary University of London um, and Emerita at the Open University. She's the founder of a journal that I'm sure most of you are familiar with, and if not, should be, uh, Wasa Theory, um, a magazine of international contemporary writing that she led for her over 35 years now. And she herself has published um, widely, especially on the Caribbean, South Asian diaspora, and on various aspects of Black Britain. Uh, from 2007 to 2013, she led a major research and public engagement project on South Asian Britain. And her books include Home Troops, Fictions of a South Asian Diaspora from 2002, Writing Across Worlds from 2004, India in Britain from 2012, and Asian Britain, a Photographic History from 2013. She's currently writing um, a group biography entitled uh, the, the Bloomsbury Indians. Um, she has been awarded an honorary fellowship and the 2019 Benson Medal from the Royal Society of Literature for her lifetime's achievement in this field. And the English Association has also marked her contribution to English studies by nominating her to the fellowship. Um, joining Sushila will be her co-editor, Mark Stein, who is Professor and Chair of English, Postcolonial and Media Studies at the University of Munster, where he runs the National and Transnational Studies Programme. His research interests include dias diasporic literature, transnationalism, and postcolonial studies. And his books include Black British Literature, Novels of Transformation, uh, more recently, uh, Locating African European Studies, Interventions, Intersections, Conversations, which was published by Routledge, uh, the Cambridge History of Black and Asian British Writing, of course, and also Ideology in Postcolonial Texts and Contexts, uh, which was edited with uh, Katya Sarkowski. Um, maybe I can begin, Sushila and Mark, uh, with, with a quote, and I know it's something that um, kind of magnetizes you, and it comes from Moses Ascending um, from 1975 by the great anglo trinidadian writer Sam Selvam, um, and in the context of the novel, it's, um, it's Galahad talking to, uh, to the lovable rogue Moses. Man, says Galahad, you're still living in the dark ages. You don't even know we have created a black literature, that it have writers who write some powerful books while making the whole world realize our existence. Um, he's expecting to cut Moses to know, um, but that was in 1975. And kind of sort of judging by, by more recent times, it still comes as a, a revelation, source of puzzlement and bewilderment to, to some people, that there is by now a, a, a long history of, uh, of writing by black and Asian writers in, out, sometimes with, uh, with, with Britain. Um, so we have to kind of reinvent the wheel and we have to go constantly draw people's um, attention to what seems to be an endlessly reappearing, endlessly disappearing to uh, topic. But perhaps we could begin by talking about the background to this project, um, how it emerged from which of your other um, kind of creative and intellectual projects um, it, it, it's the kind of the latest outcome and how you feel it maybe speaks to, to the present moment. Who wants to go first? <laughs> you can go first. If you... Okay. Um, well, I guess it, it, it feels a bit like a, I've put a lot of my heart and soul into it in the sense that I have been working in this field for a very long time, especially with Wasapiri. Um, and I think it's kind of an accretion of things, really, um, the book uh, and ways of thinking. Obviously, a lot of my work started actually at the University of Kent, which was my kind of mentoring institution that got me to see the world and to think differently through reading people like Jean Rees and Sam Selvon and Derek Walcott in the 70s. And I, I'd come through a, you know, a grammar school education in Britain. I hadn't really read any texts in my sixth form, um, other than Passage to India. And it was really an eye opener at that point for me. And I became very committed to, to teaching and actually to decolonizing the curriculum, which I guess is a buzzword again nowadays. Um, 
and, and work very hard at that. And in a sense, Wasafiri, which is concerned with cultural traveling and was initially very much focused on Black, Asian and diasporic writers, um, was really, its mission was to bring these writings into a real platform. And, and it's interesting that you started with that Selvon quote, which of course was ironic with Galahad talking to Moses, who was trying to be a writer in that novel, the whole point about it in a way was that he wasn't being taken seriously and you know I think for years people have kind of from my perspective have known that there's black writing but there, there was like a double think it was always V.S. Nair Paul's okay but Sam Selwyn no um you could have a TLS edition featuring Commonwealth writing you know Derek Walcott V.S. Nair Paul again Salman Rushdie etc 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 at the same time as we might be publishing in Wasapiri, the very same writers, but they'd be seen as ethnic minority. And that kind of labeling kind of belied a potential enlargement of the imagination, in my view, and it's con continued to do so. And so that was partly what drove my mission to do this book. Yeah, Mark. Yes, I mean, uh, it's so fascinating to hear you um, talk about this, Sheila, and in a sense, it's an ongoing conversation we've had for not just many years, but decades, really, um, which, you know, has been very enriching um, to me. On one level, uh, it's it's quite obvious that I'm an, an outsider to this. You know, I come from another country. I'm not from the UK. Um, and uh, I'm also, you know, a white critic in, in Black and Asian British uh, writing. And that's, if you want, a peculiar situation to find oneself in. And yet, at the same time, you know, my interest goes back a very long time, you know, even to my student days. I was very fortunate when I was a student in Frankfurt that what is now called the post-colonial, that name hadn't been invented then, you know, was being taught. I didn't even realize as a student that this was unusual at the time. And then when I studied uh, in the UK, um, again, I was fortunate enough to come across a lot of black British writing and uh, certainly in the MA, which Sukdev and I did at the same time in Warwick a long time ago, you know, there was even a course on black British writing um, taught by David Davidin in, in the early 90s. And, uh, you know, that, that was certainly formative, as have been many conferences, but also sort of my own, you know, familial connections, family connections uh, to Black Britain and having lived in the UK, UK for in London for um, 20 years. So it's been a journey. And I like uh, Sushila's um, uh, uh, term, you know, an accretion, because the book is an accretion. But of course, um, you know, the experiences we go through, they also form accretions in our brains, right? So I know when I um, uh, you know, read a text by David Dabedin, I hear his voice. And that's true for all the writers that I've ever met personally. You know, if they've done readings, you know, you know what what they might sound like. And so, you know, there, it's it's more than just writing in in a book, right? It's 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 a live connection, I think, that you forge with people over the years. And um how to convey that in a book, in a history is of course, you know, very complicated. So my relationship is one, you know, where I, you know, I teach at a university and, you know, run classes that try and do that, try and get students on board to do this. This has changed over the years massively. Um, it used to be that it was hard to get Black and Asian British books, right? You had to go to specialist bookshops and, you know, travel a long way. And these days, you know, you just open Amazon and and, and they're all there. Um, so there, ha and there have been changes. But interestingly, like Sukhdev said, you know, the, the wheel has to be um, invented again and again. You know, Galahad telling Moses, who tell you uh, you could be a writer? You know, so it's it's two characters disabling each other, as it were, rather than saying, great, you're a writer you know, and supporting him. He challenges him. Right. So it's, it's also about, you know, the field, um, you know, perhaps falling apart rather than coming together. Uh, what you can see in that uh, in that scene. And it's also this moment, you know, in 75 to say we've created a black literature. Yeah. Then there's perhaps the Zadie Smith moment, you know, with white teeth in 2000 mm -hmm. or Bernadine Evaristo winning the Booker last year. So time and again, we think, oh, this is it. And you could go all the way back to Equiano, 1789 and say, well, this is where it all begins. And, you know, he he made a lot of money. He was famous. He was self-published. He was an activist. He was so many things writers today still aspire to be. Um, and yet it, there seems to be those waves. And I think that motivated Sushila and me 
to embark on this history. It's not um, our vision exclusively because we have so many international scholars uh, from different fields and it's all their voices and all their research that they've been doing. And so we thought, you know, these waves just need to be uh, recorded in that book. Yeah, you, you, sorry. You, you, just wanted to add there that it, obviously I'd like to say, I mean, to all those who are listening and to all our contributors that this book stands on the shoulders of a lot of other people. It was the right moment to do it, but it, it builds on the work of people like Lynn Innes, it builds on David Dabadine, as Mark said, it builds on Paul Edwards, it builds on your work, Sukdev. You know, these are all voices we're carrying as we put this thing together. And it, it's a kind of collaborative project in that in that respect, an eclectic. Well, I'm, well, I'm glad sorry, to mention. Which is a key point, sorry, just to say, it, the, the book was almost workshopped. So we brought the authors together and the chapters came to life before they were fully written. And so the, the chapters, the authors talked to each other and we wanted to capture that that spirit. So it's very much, you know, a, a collective effort. Sorry to cut in, Sukde. No, I, I'm glad that um, as well as the amnesia that sometimes accrues about Black and Asian British populations and about Black and Asian literary producers. Uh, there's also an amnesia about Black literary, Black and Asian literary scholarship, which goes back many, many decades um, by a broad range of researchers, historians, scholars, and even you know, the likes of Equiano and Sancho were being anthologized, sometimes strange anthologies back in, uh, back in the 19th um, um, century. So kind of refusing the sort of self-aggrandizement of a present moment is something that kind of comes through in sort of different modulations through the course of the book. Um, could, you, could you talk a bit about all of that said? What were the particular challenges and also the possibilities about conceptualizing this um, in, in the present moment? And may, maybe you could talk about what kind of book you didn't want to produce. I think we didn't want to produce a book, but in a sense, just obviously every history is written in the present moment, but we didn't want to produce a book that was speaking to the politics only of the present moment, I guess. And it's really interesting what you were saying because about amnesia, um, and I will I will go on to your question, but I mean, in terms of amnesia, um, it was interesting that last year, you know, they had those two exhibitions get up, that stand up in London, um, which was Horace Obey's um, and, and many, many other artists work that run by Zach Obey, his son, and at the same time, there was a Caribbean artist on at the Tate. Um, and everybody in the newspapers was saying, you know, the world has changed. We're suddenly seeing all of this, you know, globalization. Maybe we missed all this before. But actually, it's kind of like a kind of weird reading of a, a distortion that was always there in the past. So people didn't see that, you know, Paul Edwards had produced a wonderful version of Equiano or that. David Dabadeen had edited the letters of Sancho and so on. So I think what we wanted to do with the book was really through its material context, as well as its particular political moments, locate the literatures as they emerged. And obviously, there's a kind of promiscuous genealogy there, as one of the contributors called it, which was a, a good term, because we had to kind of produce the history retrospectively to think around the terms black and Asian, which actually only became into currency in the 80s and 90s, um, and, and locate them back or, or, or look backwards at how those things emerged when writers would have, and, and always still do, actually many still do, belong to many, many lands, many, many geographies, many, many regions. So they kind of, we had to be aware of the distortions of history from the start, knowing that we ourselves were distorting it, I suppose is what I'm saying in a sense, by selecting what we were doing. And, and what I could maybe add to uh, to that um, and, and in response to your question, Sukdev, is that um, one of the issues we were aware of is that, you know, a history and, you know, perhaps especially a Cambridge history of, of, of you know, literature um, carries a certain, you know, authority, which on the one hand, we wanted for that field. We thought it's important for it to get that recognition and to make this point that this writing stems from four 
centuries, that it has a long history. And at the same time, as Sushila's already said, it's actually not one singular history. You know, it's not monolithic. And it's also not two either in terms of, you know, Black, British and British Asian. But it's actually literatures, you know, with lots of connections within the UK and also across the globe coming and starting up again, reaching back in time and also looking forward. So it's a very, you know, intricate tapestry rather than a, a monolithic history. So we wanted this, <clears throat> you know, this weight for the field. We wanted the recognition, but we, we wanted a, an open and in a sense a porous uh, hi, you know, history written with the help of, of you know, over 40 authors um, that, that uh, contributed um, to the work. And so this porosity, I think, you know, marks it throughout in a in a good way, in a positive way. Even the very categories we use, you know, Black and Asian, they're porous. They've meant different things at different times. And as Sushila said already, you know, we're using them now in a sense, a historically, when we speak of, of the 18th century. Um, so as you implied, Sukhdev, we're doing this from the vantage point of, uh, of today. But we've you know, encourage the authors and tried ourselves to be, you know, sensitive to the uh, contexts, which are multiple. Um, so I thought I'd uh, throw that in. Yeah, yeah, history is contested, contested terrain as an active process, I guess. Um, yeah, sorry. Yeah. So what was at stake for, for both of you about insisting on both Black and Asian in the title? We now have MAs, I believe, so sort of devoted to Black British literature. There's uh, obviously an upsurge of interest in, say, Muslim literatures or different forms of categorization, different forms of identity, mutation and hybridization. Um, and as you as you said, Black and Asian is itself has a certain kind of temporal associations. What 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 was important to you about holding on to this term? I guess, I guess it's tricky. Yeah, you go, Sushila. Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, inevitably, it's connected with race, you know, and ethnicity, you know, black and Asian. But that wasn't really how we particularly wanted to locate it within the history. I think it was the idea of, of British history being it, black and Asian have been linked through empire, I think, and, you know, theories of, you know, around migration and diaspora for a very, very long time, even if you go back to how, you know, Sikh bin Muhammad was referred to in the 18th century, whether he was an Asi Asiatic or Oriental or whatever, um, there were these kind of racial categories um, for, you know, however they were used at the time. So I think we wanted to point to that shared history at the same time as saying, there's in no way are these, these terminologies containers for Asian writing, for black writing, but the way where we are right now, and and I think the Black Lives Matter movement, in a sense, is is quite an interesting contemporary issue around this in in terms of British history, anyway. Um, black and Asian um, have come together through the 80s and 90s, and it's the way it's talked about in terms of academic discourse. And I think we we were using that, but at the same time, trying to interrogate it all the way through. Um, and, and so do the contributors. I think that's that's one of the you know um, connectors across the chapters that the terms are not taken for granted. And I think it's it's crucial. Um, it, it's interesting because you know in in migrant writing, one often talks about generations and speak of, speaks of first or second or third generation writing. That clearly doesn't quite work in Black and Asian British writing. You know, is then you know Equiano a first generation writer? Where does that leave contemporary writers? You know, clearly. This this approach doesn't work. And likewise, um, if we don't believe that black and Asian are sort of containers, you know, that that are homogenous and hold, you know, a body of literature, what do these terms um, signal? I think they signal interconnection, they signal diversity, um, but we register in the book that, you know, uh, British Asian authors 
came at very different moments in history of the British Isles, and they came from different places. They came from the subcontinent, they came from the Caribbean, they came from Africa. So, you know, there is no, uh, you know, particular homogeneity there. And the same is true of writers of African descent. And then the, the question that that leads to, of course, is, you know, where does, uh, where, you know, the, where do those features actually reside? Black and Asian, you know, in the text with the author, is it thematic, is it formal? You know, it became, becomes very academic very quickly, but that can also be uh, productive, um, I would argue. Um, and I think uh, because we started with Selvin, so you have um, a writer from the Caribbean, from Trinidad, who's um, Indo Caribbean, right? But he writes about many of his characters are of African descent, you know, so I think that just shows um, that I think. The, our um, opting for uh, an, a, a wide, you know, and an encompassing history rather than one that's narrow and more specific. You, you mentioned the Goldsmith MA that focuses only on black writing, you know, not on British Asian writing. But we focused, you know, on, or we chose to have this wider focus because we think the writing bears out that that is required, um, which I'm, allows me to speak to another challenge because that was your question, Sukhdev, you know, so the challenge was also how inclusive do you want to be you know how big does this history need to be there are now 40 parts of course they could have been 60 parts or 50 parts you know this took many many years already um, it's a, a history that's beginning to be written and and more needs to be added and the contexts um, you know are growing so there's further connections that one can um, can make yeah, I yeah. think the other thing with Black and Asian is the productive alliances between those two groups, you know, yes. however yeah. you read them. And, and even though they come from plural histories, um, there are alliances. And, and just, you know, I think one of the challenges was was linking those two. I mean, because some people would not agree with that as an approach. Um, yeah, we've been using mostly uh, the language of literature and um, so there's certainly that's a word that's used in most of the other titles in the Cambridge series, but uh, series. But uh, you've both chosen to use the word writing. Um, yes. Could you talk about uh, may, maybe draw attention to the, the range of the materials that um, you've chosen to um, spotlight? Well, this was another debate, this whole thing around writing. Um, obviously, we were trying to be provocative because literature traditionally suggests the valorization of canonized texts, whereas writing stresses the inclusion of and engagement with a range of complex histories, communities and genres. And we chose that. It enabled us to open the book a bit more. But, but to answer your question, we also chose it because we're dealing with orality, we're dealing with performance texts, we're dealing with film, we're dealing with um, drama. Um, and, you know, there was, you know, um, even in the 18th century political discourse, which was produced as speeches and so on. So we just wanted, because of the nature of the writing that we're drawing on, to create this idea of a kind of, um, and this is a term, and I'm taking this from Alison Donnell, um, a collective autobiography of the nation if you like, a collective autobiography of these communities speaking across time, horizontally and vertically to each other and discoursing and us as critics interrogating that ourselves and discoursing about it. So we have all these dialogues going on in the book. And that's, I think, how we also dealt with our all, all, all our contributors too. Um, and that does imply, of course, that, you know, it is, a, it is a risk one takes. It can be misunderstood. And, uh, you know, because the term, the epithet literature is then not on the cover of that book. But I think it was a calculated risk and it was important um, to take it. Of course, you know, there are a lot of literary texts in the narrow sense that are discussed in this book. But there is just more material and it makes the history so much richer. And, you know, I think therefore um, we deviated from what the Cambridge histories normally do. But we're happy that they, you know, we had some discussions, but they they agreed, you know, that that's a good way to go. In that sense, it's it's perhaps, you know, a special history, even in that series. One of, one of the realms um, in which black and Asian cultural aesthetics and uh, kind of issues are being thrashed out and disputed 
is um, on, on different forms of social media and on uh, dig digital screens. Uh, sometimes they're productive, sometimes um, le less so, but um, it, it, it's a thing. Um, were, were, you were you tempted to try to identify and uh, anatomize a kind of diasporic um, um, digital realm in, the, in your volume? I think we were. Uh, certainly we were. Um, and, it, and we touch on it. Uh, we certainly touch on it in the introduction. But I think, you know, we've moved on a couple of years, really, since we were working on this. And I think there'd be now there'd definitely be even more material to create a chapter on that. And we certainly looked at popular culture and and TV. And I know, obviously, through, you know, um, Bernadine Bristow contributed to an essay to a Wasafiri um, book we did for the 35th birthday on, on black women's writing now and how it gets published. And the, the younger generation of black women writers turning to social media, turning to digital forms of publishing in order to get past the gatekeepers, which are still there. Um, despite all the things we think have happened, those gatekeepers are still there and that younger generation are finding this a, a wonderful platform to uh, for enunciating their positions and, and to experiment with new aesthetic forms as well. I, I would also say, you know, it is important to look at not just literature, but Twitterature, right, to sort of uh, see what's out there on social media um, and in the digital sphere. Um, but it is extremely difficult as well to historicize it. It doesn't get archived in the same way as printed, as textual material, like like orality, which uh, Sushila mentioned already. Um, but that's not a reason not to do it, but it is, it has its own challenges. Um, and um, on the one hand, yes, uh, it can be a way of bypassing the gatekeepers. But of course, um, there are, um, you know, gatekeepers too in the digital world. And so uh, whilst it, it, you know, provides platforms uh, for young writers, um, it does, you know, it's, it's clearly not the only way in. I mean, there is a, a lot of major publishers who have been actively looking for, for uh, Black British and Asian British writers. And um, so I think, you know, the two need to be seen um, in connection as well. Um, and, but I take that point, you know, this is probably where, you know, one of the future chap chapters um, lies. It remains to be seen how significant uh, mm -hmm. and how big um, this, uh, this sphere will, will be, but it looks like it's, it's growing. We all use it more and more day by day, um, but because stuff disappears, you know, uh, without a trace. Um, it's, it's also, you know, something that makes me really sad if you think of, you know, stuff that's posted on the web and then it's just gone, it's taken down, it's lost. Um, so one would all the more need to archive it and then historicize it too. Well, I guess one of the things about the book also, which is, you know, going back to your question about challenges, is where you're trying to create a history which often, and, and amnesia, you know, doesn't have an archive. That isn't a, a, a sort of easy archive against which we're writing or which we're developing, you know, this isn't the third Cambridge history of Black and Asian British writing because there were so many more before, or Oxford histories or whatever histories, this is the first Cambridge history of Black and Asian British writing. And so a lot of the material that's in it is actually, it's not a compendium, it's actually new archival research, you know, which people are bringing and have brought to, you know, to bear on their chapters. And, I think that's really exciting. And I think the thing about archives, and, and there again, it's you know one of the readers when we were first, you know, when it was going out for reports at CUP, I think one of them said, you know, what's the difference here? Is it just an anthology or is it a history? You know, well, you yeah. know, that, that's an issue. It's another issue we had to face, but you know, how do you create a history when there isn't a history there to start with? And you have to invent it somehow. So, um. You've met the name um, Bernadina Baristo's um, come up, and of course she's now very well known as uh, for many reasons, including as a as a, as a book of um, prize winner. But I guess for most people, the kind of preeminent um, prize for literary fiction in uh, in Britain and 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 the, and the Commonwealth. Um, but she has a very rich career across a range of uh, forms. And as a, as a kind of creative activist, um, 
I would imagine some of her paths intersecting over over time with with yours, Sushila. Not to use her um, as uh, kind of representative of kind of every uh, of everybody in the book, but maybe you could say a little bit uh, about aspects of her um, literary and kind of creative production, maybe from the 80s and the, the 90s, that are portals into the kinds of kind of output, the kinds of um, uh, energies that the volume as a whole is, um, is, is spotlighting and celebrating. I think, you know, certainly I, I met Bernadine when she was publishing in the late 80s and 90s, and I think Lara was her first novel, and then she did a new version of it, which was kind of largely autobiographical. Um, but she was before that. She was a you know she was putting on plays. She was an activist in theatre. Um, she was already very very. She was a poet. Um, she came onto the Wasser Theory board um, quite early on as as one of the editorial advisors, and then later a director. Um, and we reviewed a lot of her books. She wrote a wonderful novel called The Emperor's Babe, which was about Black London. Um, and she writes in this sort of um, po poetic, so poetic fiction is a form of poetry, really. It's, it's a non-standard form of writing a novel. And I think Girl, Woman, Other is, is the same. But I mean, yes, I think she has, has had much deserved and huge notice now, but actually, the night the booker was happening, I happened to be getting texts from, I won't say who, various people on newspapers saying, you know, who is this person? Can you send me an article? You know, they didn't know. And there was a lot of running before those newspaper pieces came out. And that's disgusting in some ways that people really didn't know who this writer was in detail. They hadn't really thought about it. Um, and then there was the whole debate, as you know, about, you know, should the prize have only gone to Bernadine as a black woman writer and not to Margaret Atwood and Bernadine. And I felt very strongly on that one that, you know, that both books had to be assessed for their quality and that we shouldn't go down the line of simple cultural politics there. Um, and I think it was acting against it. And I think Bernadine felt the same, actually, it was acting, you know, moving against what was a judgment about her literary merit. Um, and I think that that's pretty tricky. You know, it, it is tricky. And I think it's going on quite a lot in debates that are current at the moment in review pages and to some degree, the platforming of events, live events. Um, and I think it's something we have to be careful about um, how we read these writers through which lens. I think uh, if I can just add to that, that she um, is in a, in a certain sense, you know, a, a wonderful example of the creativity that uh, that we find in this field, because like Sushila said, you know, it's highly innovative and, and you know, it is syncretic really, you know, she's developed her own style working across drama, poetry and fiction. And you can hear that she is a poet when you read her fiction. And you can see that she or hear that she once was a dramatist and an actress herself. Um, you know, so this is really, uh, she has worked at this, on this type of textuality that she's invented for a very, very long time. And so in that sense, it's it's great that the Booker, you know, has created this exposure, but she would have deserved a lot of this attention, you know, a long time ago. Lara was very impressive um, already, and the other books she has written uh, in between. So it it does signal also this uh, this particular case, you know, that there is actually a lot of talent out there that still doesn't get the same uh, uh, recognition that it should be getting, and there aren't enough prizes for all the good writers that are out there um, in, in this field. I, I think that's sad, um, but true. And therefore, I think it's wonderful that Bernd Everista is also this literary activist, in a way like, like Sushila yourself too. You know, she, um, uh, there, there, there are people who do so much to promote this writing, and Bernadine has been, you know, trying to get young writers, um, you know, uh, recognized and uh, she's not alone in doing that but she's been consistently doing that for a very long time so beyond writing you know she's been trying to draw attention to white publishing houses to 
white gatekeeping um, and uh, try, has tried to, to redress that at various levels and in various functions. And, you know, we, we in that sense, uh, Sukhdev, you are right. You know, the, the, the spirit that Bernadine represents is, is a spirit that Sushila and I felt needs to be carried uh, by this history too. Um, it, you know, it is, it is a collective effort in that very sense. And it, you know, the history is definitely trying to do something, you know, it's, it, you know, it's an activity to historicize. So Sheila said already, you know, there wasn't such a history before, which makes it difficult. You know, you're not revising an earlier history that you can look up, but history is always constructed, no matter, you know, which history. So this work of construction, we needed models and we would look to writers and activists in the field and see wh what are their views of this area. So this is, I think, how her handwriting and, and other writers, you know, can be felt also in the structure of the book. So if we're saying it's a porous structure, um, it's partly because it has to be with authors like Bernadine Everista or like Carol Phillips uh, or like Salman Rushdie. Um, you know, we have to account for the, the, you know, the special material that we're covering. We have a question from um, Dr. Hussein Ahmed, um, which I'm just going to read out. Um, he asks a question, which one is correct? Is it um, Black and Asian British writing or diaspora, diaspora Asian Black writing? Isn't it another imperialist approach to term diasporic literature as Black and Asian British writing? Isn't it another form of otherness? If not, why not? For, and he gives the example, uh, Bharati uh, Mukherjee, who um, Doc, Dr. Ahmed says denied to herself uh, the term diasporic Indian writer, preferring to uh, describe herself as an American writer. I mean, that, I mean, I know, yes, I mean, I think in an ideal world, and I think we end our introduction with this, we wouldn't want this book to be an adjacent volume. We would rather it was just British writing. Um, but there are, I mean, we've been talking about the politics of some of these things. Um, and if it was just British writing, I'm not sure there'd be a lot of space for it um, at the moment. So I think in a sense, we're, we're opening up the notion of British, but we are signifying the contributions that these groups who are not monolithic in any sense have made um so i take that point i understand you know where you're coming from i don't think asian or british a asian or black is necessarily imperialistic anymore um but yeah and there, 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 i think it's also important to see you know there is um often a sort of tension between the the labels that critics use and the labels that writers use for their texts. And writers actually can change, of course, right? So in the 80s, a writer might choose a very different term to the 90s or the 2000s. And and, and so do critics change their minds. Um, but you cannot historicize a field if you you know, if you don't somehow, you know, define the field in the in the first place. And we we talked a lot about this and thought hard about it. Um, so there are clearly um, a lot of writers and texts in the book that not only could be, but also should be historicized and contextualized differently at the same time. So, of course, Selvin is a Trinidadian writer. He's a Caribbean writer. He's a Canadian writer. He's a Black British writer. He's a British writer. He's a European writer. You know, he's, he's a male writer. He's, there's so many uh, aspects, and that's just one writer. But you, you have this with all our texts and, and, and writers. There is this uh, well-known debate between um, David Dabadine and Fred Degar, um, where Fred Degar uh, calls his uh, essay that he later wrote against Black British literature, and whereas mm -hmm. Dabadine, you know, promotes it. And, you know, they both have a, a, a similar background, as it were, in the UK. They're both diasporic writers, if you want, but even that's a term that you can accept or not. Uh, Degar would say, I'm just a writer. Don't label me. Many, many authors do say that. But Sushila's point is so important to say, you know, this history, we're, it's, it's not our job to sort of label the person, the writer. 
we're, we're actually looking at the texts, you know, and how they're uh, productively contextualized amongst other texts and, and the moment at which they emerge. Um, but it's clearly not static. So um, we use these terms, uh, but yes, a certain distance and even reservation uh, is, is warranted. I, I would agree with that. Um, Menaz Hussein asks, how do you deal as critics with issues of intersectionality when exploring works of fiction? That's a good question. <laughs> One. You want to start, Mark? I, I can. I was just going to say, you know, um, that, for example, um, when it comes um, to a queer approach to reading um, literature, um, we um, didn't want that only when it comes to, say, the 20th or the 21st uh, century, such a perspective um, uh, became important. But we also wanted that um, to, to be an optics or a lens for the 18th and the 19th century. So I think that is then an instance um, of intersectionality. Um, mm -hmm. You know, this is how we tried to, to look, you know, use the 21st century as a vantage point to look back, but we're also looking forward from the 18th century um, at today. Mm -hmm. And these ty types of dialogues um, are cross barriers, oh. as it were. This type of porosity, uh, I think, is our way of dealing um, with intersectional um, uh, perspectives and issues. It was also one reason we held the symposium at the beginning of the book, because obviously when you ask 40 different contributors to write chapters to a book, um, they're all coming from different critical perspectives, different periods, different views. And, and we really sat around the table for two or three days to try and formulate what I was term terming earlier promiscuous genealogy, to think about genealogies and how and intersectionality and how we would, you know, maybe queer the 18th century as much as we might queer the 21st century in terms of our readings. So we were yeah. looking at, and, and things like multi-directional memory and how that works across the book. Um, so we were we were aware of it. it I mean, it's, it's quite a difficult thing to orchestrate with a lot of different people writing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you remind me that one of, one of the things that surprised me upon first looking at uh, the book was how readable it was, which is not something that one can necessarily always say about academic tomes, or, uh, or especially academic tomes, which um, are partly about what might be um, called uh, sort of aspects of diaspora or post-coloniality. Uh, post um, could you talk a bit, um, maybe drawing on your expertise in kind of literary history and, and the history of black British literary criticism of uh, the extent, uh, could you talk a bit about the extent to which the, the volume draws attention to, uh, to kind of criticality and to debates about, about the field um, that happened outside of the academy? Um, Can I just double? Oh, sorry, sorry just, I missed one word at the very beginning. Did you say the book is readable? You characterized yeah. it, but okay, no, yeah, no, it's, all actually, right. it's actually readable. Yeah, no, makes sense. I, I thought so, but yeah. I think it goes back to, in a way, to something I wanted to say in relation to a debate that was just going on earlier. But when we're talking about Bernadine's activism, I think one of the things the book looks at is that activism and collectives and the and and the behavior of groups and communities and publishers. So there's, there's quite a strong strand throughout the book in terms of book history and prize culture, for example. Mm -hmm. And also, you know, um, there's a chapter, there's chapters on, you know, um, how various collectives like the Caribbean Artists Movement or networks like the League of Colored Peoples, um, whole groups of different um, public intellectuals in a way or, and 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 thinkers got together, which are kind of outside that academic debate that you're, we're all used to in terms of the post-colonial or black British writing and diaspora. But on the other hand, we looked at those issues through how those groups were generating discussion and what the issues were that they raised and how that reflected as a refraction on what was going on in terms of British culture, literary and political culture. Um, so I don't know if that made sense, but it, yeah. it, it was looking at those collectives. So things like, you know, the, the Black Book Fair in the 80s, what was happening there when all those people met and had, had conversations? What was happening 
when the CAM groups met, who were all those people? Um, what happened on the BBC platforms, you know, and so on? Yeah, I guess underlying my, my, my question was uh, a query about thinking about other ways of validating or extending the field which don't rely on the, what sometimes feels like the monoculture of uh, present day academia, thinking there's mm. other ways of building and developing this which aren't quite as squeezed and uh, but I'm going to first of all say hello from uh, Mahmoud uh, Midamadi in Iran. He just wants to say hello. Um, I have a question from um, Jennifer in Canada, who says uh, she's a Canadian white academic who's been teaching Bundina Evaristo. Um, how do you go about balancing the representation of these groups, I guess, black and, and Asian, so that one does not, oh, sorry, that's, that's, I'll come back to that, that, that question. Uh, Jennifer says she, she teaches black and Asian British writing in Canada, but she, she herself is neither black or Asian. And uh, when I was asked to submit a book manuscript on these writers that I love, I hesitate because I'm concerned about cultural appropriation and fetishization of the black and Asian experience. How do you address these issues? And she's asking you specifically, Mark. Yes, that's you know an important question and a very difficult question. Um, I have to say, um, a few years ago we had a conference uh, here in Münster, and it had a roundtable, um, and the, we called the roundtable "Why isn't my professor black?" Um, and you know we invited um, uh, around the panelists, and they spoke to that topic. And Sushila, you were there, uh, of course, at that conference as well, and 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 on the panel. And um, it it is a complicated question. You know, um, one does feel, you know, do am I, am I taking space away from someone? Should somebody else be doing the work I'm doing, etc.? And at the same time, um, I feel that um, it probably is good for a field to have a variety of um, perspectives um, in it, and uh, you know, that someone who's not in the UK looks at Brit British writing. As I said, I spent a lot of time there, but I'm currently based outside of the British Isles. Um, and I look at it, you know, as, as a white male critic. And that does, you know, there's no doubt about it, inform how I deal, um, how I look at texts, um, how I work as a critic. And so one of the um, strategies is in the classroom to, to discuss this. Um, in a current seminar at the moment called Black Texts Matter. You know, we have this discussion. Um, uh, so what can we do in the seminar? You know, how can we look at the text that we're studying? And um, I think that's important, um, you know, for future school teachers, for example, who are in my course, um, but also MA students who are going on to do PhDs to, to reflect upon this. So I do think that's one way of um, dealing with that. And in, in publications, likewise, you know, one has to see how one one is limited, um, but I think in a certain sense, everybody has their limitations and whether you're writing sort of from within uh, the Black British or British Asian uh, context or from without, one is never sort of, you know, one never has a complete overview and one only has, you know, maybe a Southern English experience or a Northern uh, or a working class background or upper middle class background, you know, so there's lots of positionalities that affect writing um, and, and, and uh, uh, criticism at all times. So I think it's, it's, it's a very important um, question, but from my perspective, um, it's, it's good if, um, you know, many different uh, critics and writers can come together. Um, and that's something I also learned uh, in my involvement with Wasafiri. I think Wasafiri is exemplary in you know, having this concert of voices in each and every single issue, um, writers with many different backgrounds coming together and writers not just writing about you know, their own particular group or background. I think that's informed the work of, of Wasafiri for all these um, years. And, you know, my 10 years at Wasafiri have been formative in, in that respect. Whether that answers it, I think I'm just maybe scraping the surface here. Um, I have a couple of questions, um, part, partly about nomenclature. Could the volume be called a transcultural effort uh, on account of it being so inclusive of both Black and Asian written discourse? And um, where is the other one? Sorry. 
we um, how can um, this this conversation or the, the kind of ideas behind the volume enrich post-colonial narratology? Um, I'm not entirely sure myself what the this refers to. <laughs> I think obviously you could use the we use the transcultural or the transnational anyway, certainly in the in the volume. I mean, I'm not wasn't quite sure what the question meant. Was that we use that as a title instead of the title we have, or that we address those issues? Because we certainly address those issues throughout. Um, obviously we could we couldn't avoid them. Um, I, I'm not sure. So did I miss something with the beginning no, of that? I, I, but I, th I think possibly the questions um, kind of reinforce something that's kind of come up and that a number of, as you say, the writers grapple with, which is that some of the language that you use is perhaps more accessible than we're used to, <laughs> those of us in academia. And whether it's the language, uh, some of the language of post-colonialism or language of uh, uh, transculturalism, you, you're deliberately not using that, at least in the titles. And, and so I, I, I guess everybody's coming, coming up topic from different points of views and is trying to kind of sort of juggle, juggle nomenclature. Mm. Yeah. I, I, what I would say, I mean, I, I don't know whether I understand that question correctly, but um, if we're thinking whether, you know, transcultural could be an alternative title to this volume, um, I think there is a transcultural dynamic at work, surely, in these texts. But as a title for the volume, it wouldn't do justice to the volume because some of the writers at least, you know, do embrace the term, you know, black writing or British Asian writing. And often it's seen uh, like that by critics. Transcultural, you know, is much more general. And if it were a volume on, you know, the transcultural history of British writing, it, it would have to be, you know, much, much, much bigger, you know. So the transcultural um, is 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 a is a is a bigger label, really. So we would lose a lot of the specificity that we have in terms of historical context with this mm -hmm. volume. And I think that would be true for the diasporic, for the transnational, you know, for the global, also you know the international Englishes. All these terms have been used, and Black and Asian British intersects with them. But they are far less um, specific. Not to dismiss them, but as Sukhdev said, you know, they they um, they play a role for the writing. And Sushila mentions, you know, we use the terms on and off, but at the level of the title, we are nodding to a terminology that is being used uh, at, at the moment. And I think that's important. It's a it's a political choice to speak of, for example, of black writing, and to translate it into you know transcultural writing is is you know a, a political step i wouldn't uh, want to take at, at this point in time but also we were commissioned to do you know we, the whole point yeah. of the book is that it's it's british right you know, it's british writing and yes. and it's showing that british writing is is at at heart as we all know uh, um you know a mongrel beast it's always been many yeah. many many things um it's not pure it's uh it is transcultural, it is diasporic, it is all these things. Yeah. So it's making, it's showing that Britain has to extend beyond its island borders. Yeah. Uh, we, have a couple of questions, we have a couple of questions which um, I think uh, reflect on times passing to some extent. Um, Alexandra Hirsch asks, is there a chapter on the linguistic aspects of the author's writing? Um, Alexandra still remembers writers like V.S. Naipaul being praised for their excellent English. Um, I guess I grew up reading lots of essays about is dub poetry, poetry. Um, uh, to what extent, Alexandra uh, questions, is, is language um, a categorizing feature? And there's um, also a question from Tony Murray. <laughs> this is a, a, deep, uh, a deep one. Um, Apart from the obvious one of colour, is there something that intrinsically sets Black and Asian writing in Britain apart from other British minority ethnic writing? Um, I might respond to the second one first, um, but I think, as I think I was trying to imply earlier, that the particular histories that Britain's Black and Asian citizens went through 
um, as a result of empire and migration, the histories of migration and so on, were, were linked in and created alliances that weren't separate from all other minority ethnic literatures in Britain, but had a particular, they, they coalesced at a particular point in time in, in the 60s and 70s. Yeah. Um, and whilst there was, of course, the Chinese diaspora and many, many other ethnic groups, um, including the British, of course, themselves, um, they didn't, I don't think their histories really merged in quite the same way as the Asian diaspora, the Caribbean diaspora, and those from various African communities who came to Britain in the 60s and 70s when that political label, those political labels were formed. Um, so, and, and I don't know, have Mark, maybe you want to add to that, but that's a wonderful way, actually, of, of answering, um, as you say, Sukhdev, that deep um, uh, question. There are connections to other ethnic minorities writing in the UK, clearly, um, but there are those distinctions that um, Sushila mentions. And we also said um, at the beginning that we do not take, um, you know, a Black British and British Asian as in themselves homogenous bodies uh, at all, you know, so that there are overlaps, um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a sort of messy terminology and a porous categorization um, that we use and that we think of. Um, and it shares, you know, that it does share with, with other ethnic minorities potentially, but you know, this, this is a specific context that we're seeking to, um, to capture here. Emily Watson asks, do you feel literary academia has changed in the last five years now that diversity has been elevated in importance? I think it's... it depends on where you are, doesn't it, as well? You know, I think, uh, you know, where is academia? Is that in Canada? Is that in the US? Is that in Peru? Is that in the UK? Is that in Germany, in my case? Um, I think it really depends. But from my experience, I can say, yes, it has changed. I remember when I was um, a PhD student, or even before then, in the 90s, in Frankfurt, I was saying um, to my supervisor, why don't we have a lecture on... Um, they were, you know, we had lectures on it, on Indian writing, on African writing, Caribbean, etc. You know, all the entire post-colonial field was there, but not Black Britain. And every year when I proposed this, they said, but who would do it? And what is it anyway? You know, so Qureshi, he's from the subcontinent. He isn't, but, you know, that's how he was seen. And, you know, so Black Britain was not recognized. Alistair Niven, of course, wrote an article, um, The Struggle for Black uh, for Recognition, Black British Literature. These days, that is a title that strikes you as very unusual. Even in the 90s, it seemed already quite unusual. But this struggle has been there, and it uh, seems to come back. But at the moment, certainly for the, um, you know, academy here, you don't get that question. You know, if, if, if somebody wants to do a class on Black British writing, nobody's going to say why. You know, we in, in, in Münster, you know, this gets taught by so many people in my area, but also at other chairs, you know, there's a, a strong interest and that goes back further than, than the last five years. So I think there is change, but the question is, is it structural change? Is it change that's going to last or is this fashionable? You know, that wouldn't be change. And um, this is what we alluded to at the beginning already when we compared Selvin's, you know, 75 moment with a quote that Sukhdev used, uh, White Teeth by Zadie Smith and, and, and uh, Bernard Universo's Book a Win. You know, we, one often feels something has been achieved and maybe then it's lost again. And that's very hard to, um, to be sure of. Um, but of course, now with the movement uh, to decolonize the syllabus, and that's not, you know, only in specific countries, that seems to affect many, many academies, to decolonize the syllabus um, and to, um, you know, implement diversity at various also structural levels and to call, you know, for um, uh, staff uh, in, in countries like Germany, um, which are, you know, quite white countries, really, you know, but that diversity be reflected at the level of, of the staff, you know, with all these demands and changes, perhaps the change can be more lasting. But Sushila, I'm not sure how you would see it from the British side. I think, you know, I think change is happening. I mean, I've just, you know, to relate my own experience, obviously, when I started teaching in universities, 
um, there wasn't that much going on. And I remember starting when I was interviewed at Queen Mary in the 90s, um, and I, I didn't stay at Queen Mary between now and then, I've been elsewhere, but um, I was asked to, you know, to bring these texts into the syllabus at London University. There were literally no Black and Asian or Caribbean, South Asian diasporic texts. Um, and I remember my interview and I, I remember saying to Lisa Jardine, well, if you're not doing it now, you're jolly well gonna have to, and you have to have Wasa theory as well as me, um, if I come. And <laughs> they let me, you know, it, it, it has been a wonderful department. And it, right now, of course, it's, it, these texts are taught widely across lots of different courses and they're permeated. But, you know, when I started there, I put these kinds of writings alongside Shakespeare and alongside the 19th century novel and alongside everything else so that to go back to one of the earlier questions, I, I don't think it matters in a way whether you're white or black or green in terms of reading the text, as long as you can read the books for what they are. And you can, I think it does matter, obviously the politics matter in terms of promotion and platforming and collectives and all of that. Um, but, you know, quite often people complain or black writers complain to me or critics and say, why am I always asked to review the black book for The Guardian or the black book for The Independent? Why aren't I asked to review the new novel by Margaret Atwood or the new novel by you know, somebody else? So this is a debate. So the question about whether a white, white academic should teach black and Asian writing, it goes back to that again. You know, I think mm -hmm. of course they should, otherwise we're just gonna have a beleaguered tradition of writing because nobody responds and, and just there should be healthy critical debate about these books. We shouldn't just accept them because they're by black and Asian writing writers um, in the same way as we wouldn't accept any other books. They have to be what they are and they have to be good for what they are. Mm -hmm. yeah. Where do we find that, that criticality these days, Sushila? Is it, the, is it there or in, are we writing off? Of course off? it was a <laughs> No, <laughs> but I, mean, I think it's still it's in, in small magazines. I mean, I think quite often it's in little places. It's in the small publishers. You know, the editors who take the care to really read new manuscripts that are coming in and really engage with them in the in the in the prizes that focus on little known writers not necessarily the booker or the big ones um but i think there's a danger that 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 care that concern with really maybe going against the grain a bit and trying to find things that are new is 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 going to fade with a kind of commercial interest driven by the political moment, um, which of course, this whole thing about decolonization has been going on for years and years and years, and it started in schools. That's why, that's where Wasa theory started. You know, um, it was happening in schools in the eighties. That's where the debate was. Nothing was going on in universities then. I did a study of all the U universities in the UK to see whether their anti-racist policies met their teaching curriculum. And quite often they didn't, you know, for the arts council. Um, so, you know, I think it's it's very difficult to talk about these things unless one talks about it with a sense of the history, actually. And I think those histories are really important. And going back to the saying this, this book stands on the shoulders of many people, I think it's important not to forget the many people and the many courses and the many activists in universities who were doing things, you know, in the 60s and 70s, and, and even before, before the Second World War, before Windrush, you know, which is one of the features we, we tend to emphasize in our book, the activities then. And they were doing this at times when presumably it was much harder, you know, and, and, and less fashionable. So to push boundaries at that time um, was pioneering work. But you asked about criticality, and I think, you know, the space for criticality needs to be reinvented again and again and it is in in in, in the uh, smaller magazines which you know provide critical spaces but i think i find that in conferences especially you know smaller conferences um you can have it in the classroom you can have it in research as well of course you know there are very bright students doing you know critical work um, so I think I'm not as pessimistic as your question perhaps implies, but I, I do see the danger that you point to um, as well, that writing is just praised for being there, or writers are just being praised for writing. And that's, 
in a sense, insulting. You know, one has to engage with the text properly um, rather than just praise its its existence. And um, but I think you know that's not all there is. I think there are a lot of you know very you know seriously engaged readers. And we found that at the symposium uh, in Münster when all the authors came together, um, and it was so refreshing to um, to have that. And so what we hope is that you know this this spirit is also carried by the book. And uh, I'm 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 sure you know there there's many people out there. Um, who, who think like that, right? Who want to engage critically and properly with the texts. We have a couple of questions which perhaps can uh, slightly puncture our uh, perhaps kind of optimistic reading of the trajectory um, of, the, of the field. Um, uh, we have a question. Um, I'm looking to enroll onto a PhD in African literature with a thesis focusing on black female writers. I am black and female, and when I look on university pages, I find it hard to feel represented uh, within the faculty. Um, sorry. Yeah. And uh, and even to approach professors, or even to feel like there is a place for me in academia. What advice would you give? And there's also another question, um, which is how easy is it for I never know how to say this acronym, BAME. <laughs> God, I felt we'd gone beyond acronyms, but nonetheless, whatever, however you pronounce it. Um, how easy is it for a BAME person to become a professor in universities like Cambridge or Munster? These are key questions and uh, we, we do not want to dodge them. We want to um, answer them. In terms of giving advice, that's very difficult, you know, when it's when it's not a proper conversation. So, you know, that's that's where you reach out and send emails, um, etc. But um, I think in general, I think universities have slowly become aware of that very problem. You know, that if their staff is not representative of the intake of students and of the societies those universities are supposed to serve, um, then there is a problem, and this insight doesn't make the problem go away that's for sure but what does potentially make the problem go away um, if you know the first questioner gets her phd writes on on african women and she herself is a, a woman of african descent and then gets into a position and makes her career you know this is the only way that the landscape uh, the university uh, landscape of the higher education landscape will change. My sense is that in the UK, um, you know, it has changed a lot more than in Germany, um, but a lot more change needs to happen in the UK at the same time. But I think it, it does depend on whether you look, I don't know, at a place like SOAS, which seems to be very diverse in in, in terms of its um, uh, staffing. And th there's other institutions, Sheila you know, would know a lot more about this than, uh, than I do. In Münster, I've long thought that the university would encourage when we advertise professors that we would say explicitly that we um, are at, that we are encouraging people who are from outside of Germany and people of color and the university ha is not deciding to follow that you know they're not doing it but every time um, I chair a hiring committee I raise that question and we do look um, so you know we I think people who apply if they do apply they stand a very fair chance at least in this department i can't speak for the other departments um and i would hope that that's true across um germany in uh in english studies um but let's not you know uh, belittle the effort it takes i think that you know that that's clearly there there's that glass ceiling despite all the encouragement but it needs to be challenged and it's it is being challenged at the moment mm -hmm. But nevertheless, I think, you know, it's, as Blake Morrison once said, you know, your your bookshelves become your bookshelves. And if your, your bookshelves aren't the same as the bookshelves in your colleagues next to you, as I often found in institutions throughout my career, they don't share that sense of, of academic self with you, which, of course, someone like the PhD student who's just asking the question is very important because it's not only what you look like, it's what you read and what you yeah. think like. Yeah, um, yeah. So how do you, you know, how do you create that? And the only way to create that, and it goes back to the idea of criticality again, is, is to do something like, I know this history is just one little step, but is to have 
some sense of a tradition, some sense of, of history, so that, that quite a large amnesia, and it doesn't, of course, apply with African writing, which is there's a great long tradition of African writing, but, you know, at many, many events, and, and even at the 35th Wasafiri event at the British Library last year, people were saying they did not know about certain writers. They did not know that Bernadine was writing in the 1990s. They did not know who these people were, who we were publishing. They'd never heard of them. Bucci Machetta, Beryl Gilroy, all these people, even Sam Selborne, some of them wouldn't have known. So the only way to create that sense of criticality in, the, in, the, in students is to really have that tradition, those bookshelves becoming your bookshelves, you know. I, I can only agree, but I want to just add one one aspect, if that's okay, um, with the two of you. When um, they advertised my current position, you know, all the predecessors had been Shakespeareans, and then they decided now they want to change this post and they wanted, uh, you know, to embrace the post-colonial. And but when I then finally, which I thought was exciting, but when I got here, I thought let's see what's in the library and which structures we have and. Writers of color, black British writers, post-colonial writers didn't feature. I did see a reference to Salman Rushdie, but he was misspelled. So it was, you know, Salmon the fish, not Salmon the Rushdie, you know, and it's embarrassing in an official document. But now this department has changed. And this is not a commercial for Münster, but, you know, we have linguists working on varieties of English in the Caribbean or Nigerian Englishes. Everybody in the department, whether in American studies or British studies or linguistics or didactics, they all are interested um, in, you know, this, this huge variety um, that the English language offers in terms of culture and, and literature and language around the world. So everybody's open to that. Um, and I think that's a massive change to happen within 15 years, you know, and um, this change, of course, is, is collective effort, right? It, 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 it took many people for that to happen, but I think it, that does make a difference. And I hope that our students, you know, experience, you know, their degrees differently than they would have done 20 years ago. Um, but that doesn't mean there's not a lot of work still to be done. Of, of course there is. Um, but I, I think as Sushila said, you know, it, it, it also is, is always down to the individual and to see what can, which niche can they find and how can they then push, push boundaries. And you've been doing that, Sushila, for the longest time. And Wasafiri shows how successful this can be. You know, this is something that has lasted for 35 years and it's still going strong. And that's amazing. Mm. I think yeah. paradoxically more is going on in Germany. You know, I think things have changed in Britain and, and lots of universities have changed and courses have changed and you know Queen Mary's an example. Um obviously and Goldsmiths and a lot of the London tents, you know, Essex. But um oddly enough, I always felt when I came to Germany to speak uh, or, or at conferences that people were more interested paradoxically in black and Asian writing in Germany than they were in Britain. <laughs> 